This video was brought to you by the generosity of my supporters on Coffee. Thank you for supporting the channel. Hello, my lovelies. My name's Gilbert Dovalian, and the plan for today is to make a pair of trunk hose for Pride. Now, I know what you're thinking. Gilbert, Pride was last month. Yeah, you're sort of right. But Pride Month isn't actually international as much as most countries have taken up the American date. In the UK, for example, we have LGBT plus History Month, which is in February. London Pride, which was my main Pride for many years, first took place on the 1st of July 1972, which was the closest Saturday to the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and our local Pride here is taking place next weekend. So for me, the start of July has always been Pride, so that's what I decided to go for. It wasn't just because I didn't get there in time. Promise. As with my historical Disney costume, I wanted to combine the new with the old, so I went for the obvious, a pair of paint trunk hose, which are just begging to be made into a pride flag. There's an additional layer to these as well, since they came into fashion in the reign of Elizabeth I, who reinstated the Buggery Act of 1533, which was put in place by her father Henry VIII, and repealed briefly by her sister Mary I. This act was the first time that homosexuality was outlawed by British civil law, since before then it had always come under church law. It wasn't solely targeted at queer folk though, as the act defined buggery as an unnatural sexual act against the will of God and man, so people were also tried for sexual crimes under it, but unfortunately, in no small part thanks to the British Empire, versions of it have been used to prosecute queer folk all over the world ever since. Just like in eight countries in the world today, the death penalty could be imposed on someone accused of same-sex relationships wearing these trunk hose when they were fashionable. So remember that next time someone tries to tell you that pride isn't necessary anymore. But with all of that in mind, let's get to actually making them. Once again, I'm using the pattern from the Tudor Tailor, which has nine panels and the standard rainbow flag has six colours in it, but when you go for the more inclusive progress flag and add in black and brown, that brings it up to eight. That just left me to figure out a way to incorporate the colours from the trans flag. Luckily the canyons are perfect and with the lining in white, my design was ready to roll. Before I got started though, I did need to re-pattern the panes, both because I didn't do it the first time round and regretted it later, and because I needed to lose one of them. To do that, I traced the old panes into one large shape, resized that in proportion to how the foundations were resized, and then divided the resulting shape into eight pieces. I also did the lining, because why not? let's do things properly for once. With that done, I set about gathering materials. I was able to do these almost entirely from stash. The interlining is new, but everything else is scraps from previous projects or stash. That makes this a record of those as much of anything else. This is a piece of my history as well. I made up the panes by hand, so using exactly the same process as I did for Aziraphale's trunk hose, but the rest I did with modern techniques and materials, so I'll be covering the differences here, but not recapping the entire process. If you want to watch that, the two parts are linked for you below.
And of all of the changes I made, the biggest one was the darts on the lining. Since the opportunity was there, I figured I could do a direct comparison. So instead of wadding, I used interfacing to bulk them out and only over the darts rather than laying it over the whole lining. While it saved a lot of time, the wadding gives a much smoother curve and doesn't weigh much more. In fact, the completed trunk hose are only 50 grams off one another and given Aziraphale's has longer canyons, that easily explains the difference. In other words, even when sewing by machine, wadding does work better. Like I thought, it was much easier having two lining pieces already seamed before doing the darts when doing it by machine and once again I forgot to leave the gap for the pocket because apparently there's no saving me on that. I tied off each dart by hand to reduce the bulk at the tip. And then once the panes were gathered to fit as well, it was time to face the machine for sewing that bulky fi seam. Honestly, I was dreading it, but I was surprised how well my machine took it. I did swap out the needle for the thickest one I have though, so that is something that I would highly recommend. Since that was one of my main worries about doing these by machine, it proves that modern machines can tackle them, even non-professional ones. So don't let the bulk put you off. Go carefully, go slowly, and be as gentle as you can on your machine. And hopefully you should make it through too. The other adjustment I made was to use some spare netting instead of the wadding sausage to bulk the lining out. This worked okay, but like with the interfacing, I definitely prefer the wadding. These trunk hose are much less poofy than Aziraphale's, and while that's in part because the lining is velvet on Aziraphale's, I do think they'd have been better with the wadding inside. So modern techniques are definitely quicker, but modern materials are really not up to the task. And honestly, the rest went very smoothly. All of the seams are finished with zigzag stitches, mostly before everything was sewn together to save me from having to get the machine round the thick seams twice. I guess this is kind of the poor man's version of overlocking. The panes still need to be sewn in by hand at the top, which I did with a prick stitch in matching thread. And while I do that, I want to talk a little bit more about the history of queer folk in the UK. Obviously, we've existed throughout history. We didn't just spring out of the ground with the anti-queer laws or with the invention of modern terminology, but it's very hard to apply modern theory to historical people. For example, the first man executed under the Buggery Act was Walter Hungerford, who was executed in 1540 for treason and witchcraft craft as well as buggery. The evidence against the latter wouldn't stand up to modern day scrutiny, such as a letter from his wife asking for a divorce in which he describes detestable causes, which is meant to imply homosexual acts. But in the 17 and 1800s there was a spate of arrests of men under the act that are more recognisable to modern eyes, like the raid of the White Swan in 1810, which was essentially acting as a gay club. 27 men were arrested, 8 convicted, of whom six were pilloried and two were hanged. You might notice that I've only been talking about male homosexuality so far. Relationships between women were never formally outlawed in the British legal system, although attempts were made. The Buggery Act was only repealed in 1861, although homosexual acts were still illegal, punishable by jail time, and there was no slowdown of arrests. It was over a hundred years later in 1967 that homosexuality was made legal in England and Wales, but other parts of the UK took more time. Northern Ireland took until 1982 and various overseas territories took until 2001. Since then the age of consent has been equalised, gay marriage has been legalised and protections have been put in place to keep people from being discriminated based on their sexuality. It's not perfect and even with laws in place there is still a good amount of discrimination around but we've definitely come leaps and bounds from when I was a kid and gay was the favourite insult on the playground. In the county I'm from, section 28 
1998, which is the act that outlawed the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities and in schools, ran from 1988 until the end of 2004, a full year past the rest of England and through all but the last two years of my time at school. That's exactly the same kind of laws that are now starting to raise the ugly head in places like Hungary. And that's why pride is still important. Things are better than they were for some of us, but we still need to fight for people who are suffering under backwards regimes. Until people can walk hand in hand down any street in any country in the world and not feel in danger in the slightest, I will wear these and continue to be out loud and proud. But back to the sewing, because I need to finish them before I can wear them. Rather than using bias binding to finish the waistband and the legs, I sewed the lining to the waistband and then understitched it by hand because it was too bulky to get the machine in to do it neatly. I also did a second herringbone stitch to help it stay in place. And the final touch is to whip stitch the lining into place on the legs. Sew in some eyelets. And make up the fly. And with that done, I'm ready to be out and fabulous and have a gay old time. And that's it. I really love these, it was so nice to be working on something obnoxiously colourful for once, and obviously the pride flag has special meaning to me as well. For those of you who weren't aware, the original pride flag was first designed in 1978 by Gilbert Baker, although it's had various changes and redesigns since then. These represent the Progress Pride flag, which features a chevron with the colours of the trans flag, as well as a black and a brown stripe to represent marginalised people of colour within the LGBT community, and people who are living with AIDS or HIV, and those who have been lost. I know I've spoken a lot about gay rights in the UK in this video, but I do think that it's important that as a community we're more aware of queer experiences in other countries around the world. I'm gonna link a couple of videos in the description down below that I think contain very important and interesting parts of queer history, so check those out if you're interested. As for me, well I've said it on the channel before, but to be very clear about it, 
gender is not something that I consider when I'm looking at whether people are attractive to me or not. It never has been. I identified as bisexual a long time before the term pansexual was coined. So I tend to use both interchangeably because being bisexual was such a core part of my identity all through most of my teenage years and through a good chunk of my 20s as well. I am in a straight passing marriage now, but neither of us are straight and I have dated people of all kinds of genders in the past. As for gender identity, well, a pair of trunk hose needs a doublet, don't you think? My question for you today is if you were going to repurpose something historical for the modern day, what would it be and would you make any adjustments to it? Obviously, since Morgan Donner coined the phrase history bounding, we've all been doing more and more of that, but I'm here for this. I think it's great and we should all be doing more of it. It doesn't even need to necessarily be an item of clothing either. It can be anything because well, this is an item of clothing, but obviously cloaks should come back and I'm constantly disappointed that they're not back in fashion yet. We really need to get on that. Thank you for watching through to the end. And as always, a huge thank you to all of my lovely subscribers and all of my coffee donators who have been incredibly generous. If you enjoyed this or found it helpful, please think about giving me a like or subscribing if you're not already for more sewing and costume related content or donating to my coffee if you're able. Stay safe, stay sensible, and I shall see you again soon. Bye. I acquired a friend. In a non-sewing related note, progress on our garden. We have courgettes, we have tomatoes, we have roses, and we had so many strawberries that I've eaten most of them.